From the creators of Wild Wild Country comes a five-part docuseries. It's got the real story, the real footage you haven't seen. Netflix Untold kicked off their series with their first film detailing the malice at the palace as it's finally being told. And, of course, Jermaine O'Neal joins us on the Doug Gottlieb Show on Fox Sports Radio. It's out on Netflix now. Jermaine, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Good. When you, when you, find, when you saw the, the final edit of the Netflix piece, what did you think? Um, it, it made me emotional. It made me emotional. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I look to try to do, um, you know, I, I, I try to interview, well, I've, tried, I've interviewed uh, many directors and producers um, because I, I just, after a while, I felt like the story needed to be told because it was this, this created narrative that uh, was sticking to me um, like a tattoo. Um, and what people don't realize, you know, some people may ask why now, you know, we went through an, a long you know, tenure of, of, of you know, the criminal cases and also then the civil cases came. And this thing went on for almost 10 years after the brawl, right? And so, you know, we basically had a muzzle put on us where we couldn't speak about it, right? And then once we got to a point where we could speak about it, um, it was bitter to me, right? Because at that point, I felt a certain way about a lot of different things because, you know, this narrative was created, you know, about me, um, in particular, and also you know, other people that were involved um, that, you know, really frustrated me because I knew for a fact that people didn't have all the information and didn't really even know the story. And all they heard was thug, criminal, uh, tattoos, braids, you know, out of control athletes. And that was, and that was something that bothered me because now, um, you know, I'm walking into boardrooms and business meetings and community, you know, functions and people are asking me still ask me about that night um so i wanted to do a doc and i gotta say a big thank you um to netflix uh the way brothers and the director floyd russ uh who all believed in the vision um and was able to you know we wanted to do a, a, a doc that didn't alienate a league that i care so much about to this very moment which gave me an opportunity to do the things that i'm doing uh, today and also play a career for 18 years. I didn't want to alienate um, the Indiana Pacers, which gave me an opportunity to put a put my footprint, you know, you know, you know, and presence into into the league. Right. Uh, so you know, they were able to. This was just more about having a conversation, having a real conversation, and not and not this you know crazy narrative that you know we were out of control players beating up fans. What's what's amazing about it is there's so much lost in it, right? Like lost in it was you were having a great season. <laughs> I mean, your best season. You were having a, a great season. Like that gets kind of dismissed. Like you had grown as a pro into this dominant twenty and ten dude, and and then and then you you came back and played with the Pacers for several more years. Um, but it it must have been it must have been strange, right? Because some of the people who you thought had your back. I'm sure when you I'm sure when this all went down didn't have your back now years removed from it. Now, if if you were to say this, do you feel like this is what really happened? Right. Because that's what came out of the Jordan thing is you'll get people go, well, that's what happened from Jordan's perspective with the last dance documentary. When you watch it, do you feel like that's what I feel like really happened? Well, it's not, it's not, it's not actually what I feel like. That's actually what happened. Right. And, that, and that's the thing. Right. And so I absolutely felt like. You know, you talk about, you know, I remember coming back off suspension, which, by the way, people don't realize that I actually took the NBA to court and got reinstated by a federal judge. I won that case. Like a federal judge, so 28 angles that, that, that was in that arena that night, right, and said that I had the right to do what I did. Right. Right, this is important for people to understand. People don't understand that I had just got a guy off my neck, literally jumped on my back and put his arm around my neck. I ended up slamming him on the table, just happened to look left, see Anthony Johnson on the ground and the Haddad guy standing, you know, basically standing over him, and I run over there just to clean him up because at that point I'm feeling, I'm feeling endangered. Right. And I think it's important leadership. The word leadership is, is typically used you know, in sports, but it's a level of leadership that had to happen that night when people are trying to cause bodily harm to us. 
right? And so when I look at this doc, I get emotional, right? It's not, it's not, you know, you have to understand too, when, when we, when we filmed this, we didn't film, I didn't see Steven Jackson once. I didn't see Ron Artest once. I didn't see Reggie Miller, Ben Wallace, Jim Gray, any of these people. Right? It wasn't a control. It wasn't control. It was, hey, when I called the guy, I said, look, I'm doing this doc. We need to set this, set this, you know, this, this conversation straight. Right. And, but most importantly, you know, Doug, that it was, it was a narrative that bothered me because it was my league was under attack at the time. Sure. You know, no, but became, people forget. People forget. Post Jordan NBA, you know, you were with, you were first with Portland, and they would call you know they would call Portland the the Jail Blazers, or whatever. And then this was this was the see see this is how NBA players act. And you're like, wait a second, you're throwing stuff, and there's no security, and you're not protecting the players, and and it's a little bit of a lesson for what we see now. When we see things on social media, which is you're if you're only seeing like one camera angle or one perspective, you're not seeing the whole thing. Whereas this documentary, y- you have footage that no one else has seen. You're like, oh, well, that's a completely different view of the entire incident than I thought I had when I'd only seen the highlights running like in perpetuity on ESPN. Yeah, it was controlled. Right. And, and, and the thing I have to say from a perspective from the NBA is that they were put in a tough position and I completely understood it. You know, the Indiana Pacers were put in a tough position because they had no template. Right? You have no template to deal with, you know, an entire, you know, media base, not only, you know, domestically, but internationally coming at you and saying, hey, this league is basically too black. Right? Because when you talk about cornrows, tattoos, and, and, and hip hop music, who are you talking about? Right. And here's the thing, too, that, I, that, that, that poked at me was when you say we're criminals, do, we, do I have a criminal record? So if I don't have a criminal record, and I've won, I've won the NBA assistant, Community Assistant Award three times, how do you come to conclude that I'm a criminal? Because I have braids and tattoos? Because I like hip-hop music? Right, this thing became much more than just a punch, right, or a fight, right? It became a cultural attack, and that was the real problem that I had. And I don't, I don't blame the NBA. I don't blame the Indiana Pacers, right? You know, yeah, I, I was I was a little bit sensitive over the years that it was th- that the conversation wasn't revisited because because of the almost celebration of it, the anniversary, this anniversary that continuously happens every year. Right, it's an opportunity to to set you know set the table straight now that we're away from it, but it was it was never done, and so I just felt like it was time to to have the conversation. So now we can ch- we can turn the, the page and close this chapter. Jermaine O'Neal joining us on the Doug Gottlieb Show here on Fox Sports Radio. Of course, he's a six-time NBA All-Star. Uh, he was All NBA three different three different times, uh, and of course, he was he was part of what was forever called the Malice at the Palace. There's a new Netflix documentary, Untold. It dropped today. I watched it this morning. It is absolutely uh, breathtaking to see the footage and the views that you didn't know existed about something that this is very early on in my in my broadcasting career i remember i remember how guys would say they wanted you guys out of the nba for good for good of course ron came back had end up winning an nba championship you came back and fought through it and then of course uh, you know Jax came back as as well what was it like after this? Because what, what what was it like to come back and play in the NBA? Sue to get in the NBA. How are you treated? Well, you feel you feel apologetic um, amongst to my peers, right? Because now my peers are thrown into a conversation, right? It wasn't about just the players; it was about the league, right? You feel apologetic, you know, to the NBA, right? A special place special place like I'm alumni forever right and have an opportunity to to play in that league means and meant everything to me right so I felt a certain type of way uh, and you don't really know what to say because you know that the NBA isn't quite ready to embrace you you know the Indiana Pacers isn't really quite ready to embrace you because they don't know how to really deal with it they knew the character of me as a person but now you have the pressure of the media Right, it's it's trying to it's trying to set a standard to a situation that they had no idea about. People don't even realize we were in there, we we were in that on that court for o- over ten minutes without any help. 
without a police in the building. And then when they actually got in the building, they're looking to pepper spray us. <laughs> yeah. How about the other 18,000 people? <laughs> right. And, and it's, it's, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy to, to think. And again, um, you know, when I look at this, it's like, okay, you know, it happened. Right. And you, you never, you never think going into a basketball game, um, which was a great game. We, you know, we had one big over, over the defending champions. We knew, you know, obviously they were an incredible team, but we felt like it was our time. But I never thought at any point that I'd go from playing in the basketball game to fighting for my life because now, you know, you see, you, you saw a couple of chairs being thrown in the film, but people imagine being in a, in, in a, in a, in a, a sporting event where now people are becoming violent. They're trying to separate the chairs to attack you with it. They are throwing water bottles at you. They're spitting on you. Right? It is, it is, it is a monster of a situation. And people came to conclusions on television. Right? I do believe as a journalist, you have a job to do. Right? When you say something, you have to at least do some research on it. Not say, let me, let me get my, my take in, and you don't have any of the information. And that's what was so hard for me because we were told right away that we could not comment. What's what should our takeaway be when when you have somebody who wasn't a part of it? And look, there's a lot of people. I I just you know I have guys in my crew that were ten, twelve years old when it when it happened, and they're like, yeah, I remember the I remember the highlights. Okay, I, I was in my twenty. I just finished playing and played. Uh, you know, overseas and came back, and I mean, you know, that was some that was some European stuff. Like that's like the kind of craziness, and then it just it it it, it, it felt like anything you'd ever seen bad on AAU ma- magnified. And then you, it's like this is the NBA, and this is I mean, it's been you guys are are giants, and I'm just watching bewildered by what I'm seeing. What should our takeaway be? Obviously, the first thing is like the security. I always look at it and go. The, the first thing you should do is get these people, get, get the guys that are unruly out of the building. Like, don't confront them, just, just get them out. I think so, too often times guys want to, even players want to win an argument or point out who's the bad guy. Just get them out of the building. But from your perspective, like, what should our takeaways be? Fans, players, media. So, here's the thing, right? It's a, it's a great relationship that has to come um, between players and fans. We need each other. Right, that's what makes these games so great. Um, that's what I love about playing professional sports and playing sports in general. Um, I think it's a balance, right, of, of how what what you know a fan should say to say or do to a a player, and also what a player should say or do to a fan. Um, right, where where is that medium when it comes to it? I, I do believe that you know you know every t- the leagues are better equipped now than they were back then. Right, that that was something that just wasn't, you know, just didn't happen. I think from a, from a media standpoint is, um, you know, again, you, I think you do have a job to do, you know, um, preparation um, that you have to put in and take in as much information as you can uh, before you go and make a public statement, uh, because you know each 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 journalist has a fan base. Or people that watch them and support them, so they tend to believe what what they say, right? And so, if you're going to do that, right, make sure that you're saying the things that uh, that are correct. And even if you do not, even if you get it wrong, have the same energy, the same energy to come back when cases are coming to a close that are won, right? I won every civil case, right? I, you know, the criminal part went away, right? You know. The, the, the lawsuit, I mean, the, the, the case against the NBA to get reinstated, reinstated, I won. But it was never anything said about that. Right? So you create a narrative, you don't come back and you don't clean it up. So people think that this is what it is. So, you know, from, from my perspective, it's just now we get, a, we get a chance to have the conversation for once. And we're going to close this. I'm going to close the chapter for myself. Like, I'm, you know, it, it feels like it's like I've gotten this buildup out of me now. Now people know about it. You know, it's interesting that I, you know, I went, I took a little bit of, I had a two hour break between interviews today and I went to go get my phone fixed at Apple. At Apple. And it literally, I'm, Doug, I'm not even lying. As soon as I walked in, the guy that was helping me at the door said, hey, look, you know, I, I saw the doc this morning. It's unbelievable. I didn't even know. Right? I thought it was this, but it was, but this is much deeper than that. And that's what it's supposed, that's the conversation. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's really, really good. It's really good. And I know you poured a lot of your soul into it, and you just wanted, you just wanted what really happened to be told. And I think that was accomplished. Jermaine, I know you're really busy. And you got a bunch of these. We appreciate you taking some time and look forward to catching up more in the future. I right, thank you, Doug. All right, that's Jermaine O'Neill, six-time NBA All-Star. It's called Netflix Untold, Malice at the Palace. It's now available on Netflix. 